Tart. It's time for kickoff. Kickoff versus the end zone touchdown with Boomer Asiason and Mike Valenti. Ah, uh, it's big boy school now. Divisional round is upon us. Boomer, how are you? I'm doing great, Mike, and uh, what a weekend it was. And, you know, for the New York Giants and their fans, especially those around here in New York, man, they are ignited. This place is lit on fire right now. They cannot wait for this game to take place down in Philadelphia tonight. And I'm just going to tell you right now, there's something special about an underdog. There's no question. And especially this group of underdogs that are playing for the Giants, especially when you think about their wide receiver core, you think about their linebacker sure. core, and you think about the players that are out there on the field making these plays. I mean, it's going to take a her- Herculean effort by everybody to beat the Eagles. But I can tell you, I can feel the excitement here in New York. It's back once again. It, it's, it was a hell of a lot of fun. And we're going to do this a little different this week. We're going to get a rundown later. We're going to break down what happened. We're going to tell you what's going to happen. And then we'll go around the league where I'm probably going to lose my mind on something that Boomer and I were discussing pre-show. All right. With that, let's just get into the games. We'll take them in chronological order. Uh, Let's start out the Niners, Seahawks. Niners win 41-23. I guess I want your biggest takeaway, and I want to see if it matches mine from that game. You know, for me in that game was that it showed that the 49ers can make a play at any given moment on either side of the ball, and it's going to be an explosive play. So whether it is a sack fumble recovery or an interception or a Debo Samuel take a short pass and take it, you know, 70 yards for a touchdown, that's the type of playmakers that they really do have. And what's amazing to me is that you have this rookie quarterback that's in the middle of all of this, and he is 6-0, and And while it wasn't a perfect performance by him last week, once he settled in and started hitting guys, all of a sudden that offense started to show itself. So you hit you hit on one of them, which was Purdy. And look, I'm not I'm not asking him to be fabulous, but he looked tight. He looked nervous. And he would be nervous too, man. Yeah, no doubt. Now he ended up with a great stat line, but it was uneven. And we'll get to it against Dallas in a little bit. Here was the other one. What do you make of of the Niners secondary? Uh, I think their safeties are really good, top notch, and I think their corners are probably, you know, I'll give them a C minus to a C. <laughs> uh, so I, that that's really where yeah. you have to go after them. But you also have to hope that your offensive line is going to hold up when it comes to the pass rush, yeah. because they're one of very few teams in this league that can get after you with just four guys or maybe just three guys in the pass yeah, rush. The that's stat, how talented they are. The stat is rushing four or less, they get pressure. So not a sack, but pressure 41% of the time. Yeah, That's an incredible it, rate. So when you're getting to this level of uh, the playoffs in the divisional round, you're starting to play against some really good defenses and guys and teams that have dual pass rush threats. And Nick Bosa is a monster. But then again, I could say the same thing for the defense of the Philadelphia Eagles. You know, they have 70 sacks this year, Mike. 70. I know. And they have four in double digits. It's terrifying. It is terrifying. It's totally terrifying. And, Go ahead. Anything else on this no, one? No, I was just going to say, you know, I, I think about where the Seahawks are. They'll probably give Geno a couple years. They have to. They have to. They should. And they'll probably draft the quarterback if they can, if they like one of these guys. Or maybe this could be also a situation where you know everybody's looking ahead another year. That Caleb Williams coming and out of USC. Is- don't sleep on my guy from North Carolina, Drake May. Drake May is going to be right there with Caleb. All right, I'm well, there telling you go. You. So you have two guys coming out yeah. in 2024 as well that maybe some of these teams may be looking forward yeah. to. We'll see. All right, let's go to the second game. Uh, this was the Saturday night special, and it ended up being the type of game Boomer and I expected, except how we got there was totally the unexpected. By the way, someone wake Al Michaels up. Um, 31-30 Jags after a 27. 27- this is the most on-brand Charger game in history, No. <laughs> Yes, it is. And, uh, you know, it all started at the end of the first half with a lousy punt. Yep. And all it takes is one bad special teams play, and then all of a sudden the Jaguars score a touchdown at the end of that first half, and they go into the the locker room, you know, down 27-20 to 20 and with five turnovers in the first half. Think about that for a second. They are minus five, and they're down 20 points, which is really nothing in today's NFL. No, and that then, then flip it because this is part of my 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 anger with it. I can't come up with a game where a team, forget about 27 nothing. I don't care what type of comeback it is, where you are, you lose the turnover battle 5-0. You don't get any special teams miracle. You don't get a turnover of your own. And you make up the difference. Like, that is outer space. 
it's outer space, but really it, it speaks to who Doug Peterson is and his relationship with Trevor Lawrence. And then again, it also speaks to Trevor Lawrence and his yes. ability to overcome all of those mistakes. A couple of those interceptions were just awful. They were, but the mental toughness not to go in the tank, not to write it off, and then all of a sudden, Boomer is a totally different player. It's the most important ingredient in a quarterback, and I think Bill Parcell said this one time, show me a quarterback that loses three games in a row – in which his interceptions end up costing his team the game and then have to go back out that fourth game in front of his home fans right? and and is able to win a game late in the fourth quarter by throwing a touchdown pass. So, so that attribute for Trevor Lawrence is one of the reasons why he was the number one overall pick, but he showed it. And I think he showed a lot of it here in the, in the second half of the season. They've had three games in which they've come back from yep. 17 points in those games. That, that's an amazing statistic. I love him. And it's credit to Doug Peterson and Trevor Lawrence. We're going to get to Staley later, so if you're wondering, yes, I have strong thoughts. We will get there. Let's move strong on. Strong thoughts from you, really? Never. Never. I'm very reserved. This is very nuanced. <laughs> uh, Bills, they beat the Dolphins again. Another one of these. What did I just watch? 34-31. Josh Allen can't stop turning it over. Three turnovers, 18 Miami points. Mike McDaniel can't get a play in. You go to Yale, you're a smart guy, we're taking delay games, we're blowing three timeouts before, what, six minutes left in the fourth quarter. But start with the Bills. What is your takeaway here with this Josh Allen thing? Yeah, I don't think that they've really played all that well since that Monday night game that was canceled against the Bengals the last two games. Um, and, And I said after the game on NFL Today that I thought Josh Allen would be the first to tell you that he's not going to be happy with his performance and the overall performance of the team. Now, saying all that, Mike, they still put 34 I points know. on the board. And to me, that's what he generates. He generates plays for both offense and defense. And he has that ability that we just talked about with Trevor Lawrence. And that is to put the bad play behind you and worry about the next play or the next series. And I think, look, this is going to be probably the most entertaining game of the weekend, I believe, because I know the Bengals have a major chip on their shoulder because if they would have won that Monday night game, which I think that they were on their way of d- to do, they would be hosting this game as opposed to Buffalo. Yeah. Now, as far as – let's just cover McDaniel quick. What what did you make of this? I mean, he's saying he got bad information from the booth that they thought it was a first down. Yeah, he got bad information from the officials. Okay. He thought that the officials gave him a first down. So this happens. These are the little communication things that happen within a game. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes coaches get caught and they have to call timeout. He thought it was going to be a first down. So he ran his first down personnel on the field. Then he was told that it was going to be fourth and inches and that – And this is the thing that's going on in the NFL right now. Nobody is really talking about it. It's called expedited replay. Oh, you love those? Uh, The the magical after a conversation deal? Yeah, so basically New York is looking at the game, and they are in the ear of the referee, and they are telling the referee, you know, that last call was the wrong call, overturn it and get it right, without any stoppage of play or what doesn't seem like any stoppage of play. And then the referee announces to the crowd after further discussion. Yeah. And I'm like, further discussion with who? Yeah. It's further discussion with the guys in New York. Yeah, with the IFB in my ear. Exactly. So I actually kind of like it, though. I don't hate it. I just wish they would be – I wish they would explain to fans what's happening. Well, I've tried to explain to fans what's happening, and I think we're doing that here right now. Yes. So the NFL is trying to expedite these replays without having to have a, a, you know, coach throw a red flag, a challenge flag. And they're also just trying to keep the game moving. Right. Now, that game lasted forever. As a matter of fact, that was a game, two hour first half. Yeah, that game lasted so long that they had to slip the second game, the Giants of Minnesota, 10 minutes over there on Fox. So, the thing about Mike McDaniel, he'll learn. Uh, I thought he had a really good plan. He did have a rookie quarterback in Skylar Thompson who early on was struggling a little bit, but then actually found his game. He a acquitted bit. himself nicely. I thought both he and Tyler, Tyler Huntley this yeah. week. Yeah. Played well enough for their teams to win. It was just that they were going against superstar quarterbacks and really good football teams. So, unfortunately, the backups weren't able to come away with the upset. All right, let's go Vikings-Giants. I mean, I guess the headline would be the Vikings are exactly who we said they were. You know? Yeah, right. They were a fraud. We all felt like they were a fraud because of their defense, not because of their offense. Their and offense Donatel has paid the price for one of the worst game plans I've ever seen. Coordinators getting fired all over the place. Left and right. Defense and offensive coordinators in the NFL as teams look to retool and reconnect with their players. But uh, there is no question that uh, Daniel Jones played his best game as a New York Giants quarterback and solidified, I think, the in the eyes of many, 
that he is going to be their short-term future. I don't know how long they'll go out with him, maybe four years. Well, I got a question for you later that's going to hit right at this. Okay. We're putting booms in the GM chair. Right. I, and I just, I I love, I really like the young man. I've, I've kind of watched him grow up over the last four years, and the Giants didn't do him any favors no. with you know, and kind of like what the Chargers are doing with Justin Herbert right now. They're changing coordinators again. So this will be Justin Herbert's third coordinator. Uh, uh, Daniel Jones has had four coordinators here in New York, two, uh, three head coaches. So you could just see that finally he has found the right guy to get the best out of him. So I, I thought he played a well of a football And it game. also shows, and I understand it's like the sirens call when fans complain about coaching, but, like, it, it shows you the importance of the plan. So Dayball and, and, and Kafka – the tendency breakers on first down, using Saquon as, as primarily a decoy, using Daniel Jones's legs, spreading him out, throwing on first down. I mean, that that is a – it was an incredible game plan. And Minnesota never adjusted. They never – I was stunned at Donatel, and I understand. They want to play a shell. They want – the team you're facing does not have wide receivers. And the interior of that line is soft. Boomer. How could Minnesota never alter what they were doing? Never pressure? What What was going on? Well, here's the mistake they made. They figured, you know, if they're going to beat us, the Giants are going to beat us. We're going to make Daniel Jones do it. We don't believe that he can do it. Yeah. That, that's kind of in the reputation against Daniel Jones. That sooner or later, he'll turn the ball over. He'll, you know, he'll fumble it. But yeah. that has not been the case this year. He's been basically locked up on that part. Only eight uh, turnovers, I believe through the regular season, and obviously none last week. Yeah. He played an almost perfect, flawless it was awesome. game. It was awesome. Coming into this week against the Eagles, going to be a completely different set of circumstances with much better athletes and a much more aggressive defense. Yeah. Uh, Bengals, Ravens, uh, Bengals, very fortunate to win this game. Very. Uh, man, Logan Wilson and Sam Hubbard, you know, everybody on that team should be buying those guys uh, dinner this I've week. I've never seen that before, by the way. I, I You know, it reminded me when we had the uh, Super Bowl against the Cardinals and, and Steelers – Cardinals against the Steelers, and James Harrison picked off Kurt Warner and took it back 100 yards yep. out of the end zone right at the end of the first half. All right, we've seen that. Yeah, so that kind of reminded me a little but bit of not this. Not one of these. Not the, uh, hey, it's in the end. Just kidding. It's yeah. going the other way. I've never you know, seen my it. buddy Chris Collinsworth said it right. He goes, he's just too far away yeah. to do that. And plus, he's not Justin Herbert. He's not Trevor Lawrence. You know, he's not six foot six. And it's also with the rules changes. And, and I'm not a fan of the rules change where you're allowed to have seven people push the QB. You can't stop a QB sneak anymore. Just stay low. Patrick Ricard's a 300-pound fullback. Don't try to be Superman. I yeah. didn't understand well, John, any of it. Well, John Harbaugh basically said he's supposed to burrow there. Yeah. Not Joe Burrow. He's just supposed to stay burrow low. in there. Uh, you or know, the other one is you got J.K. Dobbins, who was a freight train, hand him the football. And he was mad after the game, too, and he called out Tyler Huntley for doing what he did. Yeah. So the play that Tyler Huntley did – he did completely on his own. I hate and it. And that's always the thing that coaches are like, oh, my God, you know, when, when it works, it's great. Right. Stick to the plan, dude. Just stick to the plan. Um, quick note, Bengals lose another offensive lineman, left tackle Jonah Williams, dislocated kneecap, Alex Kappa, and then Lael Collins. Count- Look, the one thing I'll say, Boomer, we'll get to it against the Bills, once they lost Jonah Williams, they turned into a complete three-step drop, can't push it, can't run it. I, I am very nervous about the Bengals. <clears throat> They'll have a much better plan going in against the Bills, and this really does work to the Bills' advantage now Big because time. they do have pass rushers over there, even without Von Miller, that Ed Oliver is a pain in the neck. He's a guy that's a record player, player, man. Really. He's a very good player, and he's a high-energy player, which is what you love. But I will say that the Bengals will have a plan, and you know Joe Burrow proved last year with the worst offensive line in the playoffs that he could take them all the way to the Super Bowl. And when the game was on the line – that offensive yeah. line, unfortunately, showed itself when Aaron Donald broke up that last play. All right, cowboys Bucks, Cowboys 31-14, a domination. Um, they played their best game in a month. I came away very, very impressed. Only issue, Brett Maher, uh, what? A five straight extra point, Boomer, I, I don't know what to do. Well, their special teams coach, John Fossil, basically said he had the yips. And he admitted it. Awesome. They have Chuck Knobloch as a kicker. Yeah, well, he also had a good week of practice. Uh, if that means anything to you. And, you know, hopefully it gets out of his head. And hopefully when he gets on the field in Santa Clara, you know, come Sunday afternoon, that he's going to be okay. I would hate for him 
to be the reason that yeah. they lose a game against San Francisco. I think it's going to be a high-scoring game between these two teams, and it it may come down to a field goal. It may come down to an extra point. Oh, yeah. And it's going to be fa- – I, I, I'm telling you, it's going to be fascinating watching that game and just thinking about – we're all hanging on his first kick. Especially if you're going to be like me out there in listener land and you're getting three and a half with Dallas. Uh-oh. <laughs> right. uh, and the Brady stuff, look, we're going to get to it in the last segment. That way we can keep this clean. But I, I think it's pretty clear he's done in Tampa. Eight assistant coats have, have been blown out of there. Byron Leftwich gone as a headliner. We'll get to all of that. That's but a redo. It, it doesn't it seem it. Yeah, and I, and I think I think Vegas would be the perfect spot for Tom Brady. I think they would uh, love to have him there. The Super Bowl was there next year, and he would be the only player in history to take three different teams to the Super Bowl, and two of those teams happen to be in their home stadium if, in fact, he decides to go there next year. He would have a chance to do that. Oh, God. Another year of this. All right. I'll I love it. it. I absolutely I love it. I know you do. I, I hope I he comes don't. back. I want him to come back. All right. We'll get to We got a lot to cover. We're going to break down every game I love. I don't like. I love three of these games. And the fourth one, I'm just leaning on Boomer. And then we go around the league in the final segment. All that and more coming up next. It is kickoff with Boomer and Valenti. Now, back to kickoff with Boomer, Asiasen, and Mike Valenti. And welcome back. And as I said, we will get to the rundown next segment. Lots of lead news. But now... We got four really, really interesting games. I love Divisional Weekend. Let's get to the picks. Picks of the Week. All right, let's start out Saturday at 4.30, Booms. Chiefs laying eight and a half, hosting America's Jaguars. What do we want to do here? Yeah, I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to. I, I know what Patrick Mahomes is doing. He's putting up over 30 points in this game. That That is almost a guarantee. When he plays at home in the playoffs, he is about as good as it gets in the NFL. It's one of the reasons why everybody thinks that he is the best quarterback in the NFL because of his playoff performances. Some of them haven't been as explosive as others. This one will be explosive. They're going to score over 30, 34 points. I'd like them to cover the number, and I think maybe a, a late Jacksonville touchdown makes it 37-27, something along those lines. High scoring. Yeah, yeah very I, high scoring. Well, And again, for what Boomer's saying, guys, Jaguars 29th against the pass, 28th against the run, and I think they're bottom five in the league. I'm spitballing. Don't, don't bust my chop scones. I'm pretty sure they're bottom five in third down conversion rate allowed. I think it's 43 or 44%. So there's really nothing from a data standpoint that says they're going to get stops. Right. And if you go to the game they played, what was it, six weeks ago, they were down 20 to nothing. I know it looked better, but they were getting blitzed. Right. And, you know, Doug Peterson versus his old, uh, you know, partner, Andy Reid, he's 0 2 against him. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things in this game. And plus, it's, you know, Trevor Lawrence had a great game last week, at least the second half. You know, if he goes out there and plays the way he did in the first half last week, this week, uh, the Chiefs will come away with touchdowns. Is there anything to, I mean, the Jags have this unbelievably, it's a once in a lifetime win, high emotional deal. You're at home. Is there anything to a young team not being able to handle? They got to get right back to it this week, go on the road to Arrowhead. You know, I, when I see the Jaguars, say, compared to the Giants, yeah. The Jaguars spent over $160 million on free agency this offseason. Shad Khan's a maniac. He is a maniac. He spent a lot of money over the last two years uh, on two coaching staffs and on all these free agents. And these free agents have really come to pass. So it's not like these guys are all rookies and young. True. I, I mean, they are proven players or they wouldn't have gotten the contracts that the Jaguars gave them. So I think there's a belief in that team, especially on offense, yeah. especially with Travis Etienne and the way that Zay Jones and – and this offensive, uh, I how about say, Evan Ingram? It, yeah, even him. He's Where like, Where was that born. here? Where was that here? I'm going to tell you why because he's playing with Doug Peterson as the coach, yeah, and, and Trevor Lawrence as the quarterback. <clears throat> that combination That's is fair. allowing him to have about 10 targets a game. <sighs> when he was here with the Giants, it was three or four targets with the game, and, and the he dropped was, them all. Well, the ball was behind him. You know, there's a lot of indecision in those offenses with Daniel Jones and him. So, I think offensively they think they can win and they can put up any amount of points that they need to put up to yeah. win these games. But I just think the experience for uh, Andy Reid and the Chiefs and at home are going to make it really difficult on them. We're both go. We're both going Chiefs. Yep. Yeah, I'll join you. Okay. It's it's a tough number, but I'm I always worry about the Cinderella, the underdog, 
and it's like the Chiefs have just, they're lying in wait, and Arrowhead's going to be a madhouse. Um, let, it's same storyline. Saturday night, 8-15, Eagles laying seven and a half against the G-Men. Talk to me. It begins and ends with Jalen Hurts' health, right? Let, right? Let's, let's get down the brass tacks here. There are two teams in this league that I think have superior rosters over everybody else. One of them is the Eagles. The other one is the San Francisco 49ers. I agree. You look at every level, every player, and you and you tell me how many New York Giants could start for the Eagles tomorrow. Uh, for the sake of time, I will just say less than a handful. Right. And maybe, maybe two, maybe three, maybe – you know, you think about offense and defense. I mean, Leonard Williams, Dex. Yeah, I mean, they, could, they, they uh, would be in the rotation. They would be in the rotation yeah. for sure. Yeah. Saquon, if you want a premium back, or do you want to have two backs that to do to do right. different things? So, I don't know. To me, it just I just feel like there's such a discrepancy in talent on these rosters. But I also believe that there's a coaching staff on the Giants that is grizzled, that has been through the wars, and they know how to shorten a game which is what they're going to have to do here, Mike. The problem is running the ball against that Eagle front. And I look, Andrew Thomas has blossomed into a very nice player. Now, Evan Neal is way better run blocking than pass protecting, which is typical for a young lineman. The interior of that Giants line against the interior of the Eagles, I get very nervous. I'm going to see a lot of second and nines. And you have uh, <laughs> you, you have a lot of, as opposed to the second shorts that you saw against Minnesota, right. where Daniel Jones could run. So let, let's approach this two ways. Okay. Take this from, if you're Wink Martindale, how do you game plan this thing out? And then we'll get to how you attack. You know, he's got Landon Collins, especially, you know, playing linebacker now. Practice squad player I, at this I know stage that. of his career. And that's where their, their trouble lies at their linebacker position. Jared Davis was working at Blockbuster Video. He's and, back in the league at but linebacker. It, but it also kind of exemplifies who the Giants are. Right. You look at their linebacker position, and you look at their wide receiver position, and you have the same type of guy. Yeah. And everybody can get behind every single one of those guys and root them on, and hopefully it's a great story. they can do something with that. However, the Eagles are the complete opposite. Howie Roseman has built essentially a super team. When you really look at it, even the small moves he's made, like with Maialata, the kid they got in the seventh round, and they ended up extending him. That's their left tackle for a decade. Uh, the kid they got out of Wisconsin, the linebacker, name escapes me. He, he was too small, too slow. They sign him. He's a big-time player. Hassan Reddick bombs out. Now he's here. Dominator. Like, they've built a team. They have no holes. And, you know, they don't have to pay the quarterback until next year. So talk to me about the quarterback. I, I like the quarterback. I've always uh, said that he's the unquestioned leader of the team. He's the face of the franchise. He How played, healthy is he? Uh, I would say he's probably 98%. And, you know, and the reason oh. I say 98 to uh -oh. 99% is because he did run with the ball the last time these two teams played. I thought he was a little bit more reckless than I expected him to be yeah. in Week 18, and now we are about two weeks later than that. So I think he's got to be close to 100%. I watched some of the practice film that they put out. He's really throwing the ball. It looks like he's got some juice on it right now. I think his confidence is back. And if you guys value it, you can do what you want with it, but the props are out for this game. Vegas is not into giving out freebies, so if you thought he was highly compromised, uh, 50 and a half rushing yards over under for Jalen Hurts. I say over. And it's suggestive of what you're talking about. Yeah, I say over, and I think I think he's I think he's primed to have a really good game here. And I think again, it's it's the linebacker situation for the Giants that worries me. I mean, they're they're the cleanup guys. They're the guys that clean up after the guys in front of them are doing all the dirty right. work, and they just don't have the speed there. Mike. No, and here's the other problem, and I know it's been a theme: Aziz Ojolari out again hurt again and I'm not trying to make him into Reggie White I'm just saying that when he and Thibodeau have been healthy together it's been incredibly effective but unfortunately he can't stay healthy I don't think he's going to play this weekend do you again I don't and I again I think bigger faster more depth more playmakers you compare their wide receivers the Eagles wide receivers to the Giants wide yeah. receivers you compare their linebackers to the Giants linebackers you compare their offensive line to the Giants' offensive line. Yep. I mean, like, it's just a significantly better team. It's okay. Uh, what Brian Dayball has done here has been, been nothing short of amazing. And that's that's the one caveat that I will say. He may come up with something. Yeah. I, to somehow try to shorten the game. As long as they don't turn the ball over on offense, maybe they get into the fourth quarter and it's close. And I think that's going to be the case. That's why I'm going to take the Giants. Really? And the 
Maybe I'm emotionally hedging here. I'm taking the Eagles. I, I'm, I'll root like hell. I can't wait to watch it. Last weekend was a ton of fun, but I feel like the fact they're just lobbing that seven and a half at you, that's a trap. Don't you feel like it, it, the whole thing with the Giants is a grind? The whole season yeah. has been a grind. The yep. offense has been a grind. But I will say that Daniel Jones last week against the Minnesota Vikings fabulous. threw the ball as well as I've ever seen him throw it. It was fabulous. That touchdown on that little post route, yeah. I, that was no nose margin down, for error. Nose down, ball spinning, yep. tight spirals, great. running with the ball, decision-making was great. But today, it's going to be different, and it's going to be different because the pressure from the opposing defense is going to be significantly and the corners. amped up. And yes. the corners. All right, let's go Sunday, 3 in the afternoon, mm. Buffalo laying 5.5 to the Bengals. Take the lead. You've yeah. got a strong take here. Go I ahead. do. You know, there's a lot of emotion in this building, and DeMar Hamlin is probably going to be at this game. As a matter of fact, T. Higgins said this week, the receiver that he tackled when he went down and went into cardiac arrest, said he's hoping to see DeMar before the game just to say hello to him and everything else. So both teams are going to be rekindled from that Monday night cancellation. The Bengals are battle-tested, man, and even with three-fifths of their offensive line gone, I'm telling you, Joe Burrow has got ice in his veins. I saw him get sacked nine times against Tennessee last year and win a game 19-16. Yep. to 16. Lou Anarumo is a terrific defensive coach, and I think he's a better defensive coordinator than Leslie Frazier is. Here's my one question, and this is a – it's starting to bother me, and maybe it's more indicative of Baltimore than, than, the, than the Bengals, but they are getting hammered on the ground. <clears throat> And not in the they're not giving up fifty yard chunks, but it's just a continual four and a half a pop. And who's the number one yards per carry team in football? Buffalo. That's a bad recipe, bro. And Bulls. why is that? Because Josh Allen's involved in that. And and how do you lessen the turnovers from Josh Allen? You run it more. And you get Josh running the ball a little bit. I I Booms, I'm a, I'm a little scared up front both ways for the Bengals. I look in once they get into the red zone that uh, you know, somewhere between the 10 and the 20-yard line, I, Cincinnati is rushing three. And they're going to have eight in the secondary. Yep. And it's going to be frustrating. And they're going to try to get Josh to move right to left. Yeah. As opposed to straight ahead. So, I, I, I look, they're both quarterbacks are going to have good games. I think it's a really high-scoring game. You the do. The fact that I have the Bengals on my side, I'm taking the points. All and right. I think they're going to win outright anyway, 34-31. to 31. Real quick, how do the Bengals, and I mentioned it earlier, um, without getting too nerdy, basically when Jonah Williams went down, they turned into three-step drop screen game, 56% of the snaps. Yeah. How do you – all right, you have a week to plan it. How do, how do you, quote, fix – Seven-man protections if you could do it, and you got to do it with your backs and your tight ends. you got to do a lot of chipping. you got you got to try to slow those guys coming off the edge. The interesting thing will be I can't wait to see what Leslie Frazier does Yeah, because it's enticing to blitz this. Like, first of all, you go in, you're thinking, you know what? We don't have to blitz because we, we should be have, have our advantages. But right. the Bengals, you would think, the offensively are going to try to curtail some of those advantages by doing something with their pass protections. And if they do something with their pass protections, then you want to blitz because now all of a sudden you're putting everybody in a bind. But if you blitz, that means you're playing one-on-one -on -one downfield. And the last thing you want to do against T. Higgins and Tyler yeah. Boyd and Jamar Chase is being playing one on one down the field. I'm going Buffalo. I think the emotion. I just think I want the Bengals to win. I am rooting for them to win, but they are just crippled up front. I'm going to go Buffalo. Lay the five and a half. All right, Sunday. I can't wait for this game. Niners laying three and a half. It was four and a half on open, hosting the Cowboys. I love Dallas here. You know, it's interesting. My partner in the morning at WFAN, Greg Giannotti, loves the 49ers. And I'm trying to figure out what's going on between you two. I mean, are you like jealous? What's no, going no, on? no, I, no. I feel like you guys are putting me in a spot here. No, not at all. I mean, I, I'll give you my reasons is, A, I just feel like everyone's gotten super comfortable with Brock Purdy. And if you actually look at who they've played, I'm not knocking the kid, so let's not get carried away. He, he's been successful against primarily atrocious defenses. Dallas has the type of defense. I wonder if they can create the havoc mm -hmm. to get him off his spot, to force him into a mistake. Micah Parsons played a Lawrence Taylor type game last week. I guess he can play on grass, everybody. It, it just, I really look at this and I go, Dallas has what this takes. And if Dak is not busy throwing it to the other teams, right? those I corners for San Francisco stink. All right. So I, I've been, you know, 
No team is more like disgust than the Dallas Cowboys. Coming off the Washington loss in Week 18, oh, they're going to lose to Tom Brady and, and the Buccaneers. Yeah. This, this team stinks. Dak Prescott throws too many interceptions. Mike McCarthy should get fired for Sean Payton. I mean, it's mind-numbing. And Jerry Jones just churns and burns with it all. Um, I, I just think that the, the San Francisco 49ers have been the most consistent of all the teams since, I want to say, about Week Eight or nine. Agree. And they've done this with the backup quarterback. And, yeah, he was nervous last week. You'd be nervous. Hell, I'd be nervous. <clears throat> I just think that Kyle Shanahan has figured out how to make it easier for him. And look at these athletes that he's on the field with. I know. It's insane. I mean, it is. Look, you saw Debo Samuel take off last week. You saw Christian McCaffrey have a great game. You saw Brandon Ayuk just running past people. I'm telling you, it's the same thing here. So I'll give you a stat. Yeah. I'm going to give you a stat that's going to make your give point. Me a stat. All right. So teams going on the road where the opponent they're facing has two more days rest than they have. The record in the playoffs, 9-24. and 24. That would be Dallas on the nine side of things. I'm taking the three and a half. I think Boom's right. I think they win. I think Maher misses a kick because life is cruel. 27-24 Niners. I'll take the three and a half. I am taking the (laughs) Niners. All right. Listen, we got to go around the league. We've got a lot to discuss, including Tom Brady, including how one coach avoided getting fired and more. All of that and more coming up next. It's kickoff with Boomer and Valenti. Now back to kickoff with Boomer, Asiasen, and Mike Valenti. All right, we are back. So now we can get to the league news. There's so much to talk about. Let's just dive in. Let's get to the rundown. This is the NFL Rundown. Oh, boy. Boomer, we got a lot lot of ground to cover. Let's start in Baltimore because it's like the football world. If you're not in the playoffs, centers around Lamar Jackson, Baltimore. Greg Roman, offensive coordinator, out in Baltimore. Okay, so you go, all right, well, I guess Lamar's gone then. Nope. John Harbaugh says, oh, no, we want Lamar, and he's going to get input. One problem. Greg Roman's the only offensive coordinator who would ever design an offense like this. What What is your read on this? You know, it's a weird thing because last year it was Wink Martindale who got pushed out of there. Right. And thankfully for the Giants, they got Wink and you know, kind of fixed the defense a little bit. But, you know, this year with Greg Roman leaving, this kind of caught me off guard. It really did. Makes and, no sense. And there's got to be other things that are percolating underneath the surface there in Baltimore. As I heard the same thing that you heard from John Harbaugh saying he's 200% our quarterback and he is going to have input into the OC. And I'm like, wait a minute, time out. Shouldn't the contract come first? Thank you. And then the input comes second if, in fact, he's going to stay there? That's why I don't believe him. I don't I don't believe him either. But then again, you know, stranger things have happened. I Could know. this be the Russell Wilson situation? Could this be... Uh, The Deshaun Watson situation, is there a team out there that is willing to go for Lamar Jackson and change everything? But what offensive coordinator? I don't want to sound slanderous, but like what OC would want to work with him and be charged with throwing it 600 times? Like what what does Lamar want? Well, I would think that John Harbaugh already has that guy in mind. I, I have to believe that you don't do something like this unless you have the perfect person in mind. All right, so Lamar, if you're in charge now, we're at the point of sign, tag, trade. Where are you at? Not the Ravens, you. Well, (laughs) there's a compelling case to be made for the Jets because Woody Johnson wants a big-time quarterback. I got something even better. But then again, if you go to the Jets, you have a problem because you're off, your wide receivers were already disgusted with the quarterback. Well, Elijah Moore would be boarding a rocket to space. <laughs> yes, <he would> be. <laughs> he, 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 please. But the interesting thing is, you know, the Jets are out there looking for offense coordinators, and the coordinators that they have had in here that they have interviewed don't match up to no. Lamar Jackson. So I don't think that's going to happen. You but, want one? Uh, give me one. I, 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 last week, people, he charged me with this. He goes, but where is he going? I, I thought about this. I'm sick. Here's a perfect spot. It's a coach we love. It's a franchise who needs a QB. And they already have a Baltimore-esque running scheme. NFC. Commanders. Uh Uh-uh. Better. Better team, better infrastructure, better coach. Saints. Same division. Oh. Atlanta. Atlanta. Artie. The Artie party. The Artie party. Yes. The ground scheme he's already built. You have a couple nice weapons, right? Pitts. Maybe we can re-engage his career. What are they committed to? Desmond Ritter? No way. So then you're saying that 
Greg Roman could come down to uh, Atlanta. He it's could be a the party. Offense coordinator, and you could trade him out of the conference. So you don't see him in the playoffs unless you see him in the Super Bowl. Not bad. And maybe Lamar is happy by going to Atlanta. He's a Florida kid. Right. Okay, talk to me. Is that insane? Uh, no, it's not insane. That's given not the bad. Fact, given the fact that they tried to do it with Marcus Mariota this right. year. Now, all of a sudden, you have this electric player. And the other thing, too, let's face it, business-wise for the Atlanta Falcons. Arthur Blank. This would be a, a fit. That would be perfect. Got so, a yeah. big stadium to fill, and you got boxes to sell. And you need a personality to do that. And that's exactly what Lamar Jackson would be. And, like, I think you'd be meeting all the expectations with both teams if, in fact, Baltimore does trade. And you would think that Atlanta has enough assets to send Baltimore. You know, sometimes the squirrel finds a nut. Maybe you should be a GM. Uh, listen, I, hey, Howie Roseman never never uh, was a big-time football player. He did it. You know, Mike, i got to be honest. I never even thought about the Atlanta Falcons. It's not I bad. don't know why. Maybe just because they're off the radar with me. But when I think now that you lay it out the way you did with the running game and the way that they mm. were able to stay in games this year, even with a Marcus Mariota that was holding them back in the passing game, this would be electric. And, and you're talking about Lamar on turf inside. Out of the <laughs> AFC. Pretty, yeah. pretty good. Yeah, makes, All right. makes sense. Let's go to Tampa. A lot to discuss there. Start out, basically every assistant's been fired. Byron Leftwich, the headliner, offensive coordinator. All right, start with, if this is a complete rebuild, Tom's gone. Right? This, this sounds like a complete retool. Yeah, 100%. It looks that way. And, again, you know they are right in the right position. I don't know, get some guy in there, reasonable quarterback, and have the worst record in football and come away with Caleb Williams next year. And I know you talk about your guy at uh, North Carolina. Drake May? Yeah. Whatever. But, but Caleb's just, uh, great. Caleb's going to be the number one pick overall. I, I have no doubt in my mind. And could you imagine Tampa Bay, you know, biting a bullet this year yep. and maybe having the worst record in football and then coming out of the draft next year in 2024 with Caleb Williams? And the smartest but, thing they could do, and it takes guts to do it, you got to liquidate assets. They got players people would want. It means Vita Vea. It means Devin White. It means you need to begin building draft capital. 100%. And then you, and that draft capital then supports your young quarterback Correct. if, in fact, you do that. Now, a lot of this is going to depend on who they you know, hire as an offense coordinator. Who are they going to have as their quarterback? And it ain't going to be Blaine Gabbert for sure. We know that. Uh, please don't so do that to it's, America. But I don't know who they're you – know, they could draft one again this year. But I think if they really take a, a look and they expand their vision – they could look to 2024 and think that maybe if they get – they do have the worst record in football, they're going to have to deal with a lot of headaches and heartaches. But at the end of the day, you're going to get the ultimate prize, and that is a can't-miss quarterback that will ignite your fan base for the next 12 years. Where's Tom going? I mean, I, I, I've i scoured the uh, interwebs, but we don't need to. You already know where he's going, so just tell America. <laughs> I'm news. saying Las Vegas. I'm saying uh, <sighs> reunite with uh, Josh McDaniels. Uh, this is a team that's uh, in a very difficult division. This is a team that – Worst you know, defensive football. But they also need a finisher at quarterback. That's That's been their biggest problem. They get out to these big leads, and then they lose these yeah. leads, and then they're unable on offense to come back in the fourth quarter and win these games, and that's where Tom Brady comes in. Well, you, you take a business. look at the offense. You take a look at the offense, and then you take a look at, you know, Las Vegas, and you want to sell a team. And business. You wanna, yes, and you want to have the Super Bowl in your home stadium, and you want to be a part of that, the best way to do that is to sign Tom Brady at a maybe one-year $50 million deal, and let's call it a day. Oh, God. All right. I I guess I just I've, – I've had it. I, I just can't. I can't. I, I got to I know it. you're addicted. I you am. You are. It, you such love great, it. You're such a great player, such a great personality. And for somebody like me who has covered him his entire career – and has watched every major game he's been in, has analyzed games that he's been in, and have watched this thing unfold. I, I don't want it to end. And I don't want it to end for Aaron Rodgers either, by the way. Oh, we're going to get to him. I'm sure uh, we will. Uh, so let's let's do this now. I know you have the answer. I know where I want him to go, but the ownership is too awful to do it. But where does Sean Payton go? Or does he sit it out? Um, he may go to Houston. Doesn't seem like it fits, right? Oh, I mean, they have draft capital. They have a lot of draft but capital. But the organization's a wreck. 
Well, that Nick Casario knows Sean Payton. You know, that's that whole Belichick Parcells thing. And don't think that Parcells doesn't have his hand in this. Oh, I know. I, I think once the uh, Chargers decided to stay with Brandon Staley. That's where he needs to be. <laughs> He's not going there. No, I'm just, hold on, work with me for a minute. Just, just you're, you're the Chargers. You have Justin Herbert. You're going to ruin this kid. You have the ability to go, Sean Payton, would you like to live in L.A., make $20 million a year, and you get... Justin Herbert, do whatever you want. What are we doing? This is where I can't stand the Spanoses. Did you hear what Anthony Lynn had to say about his time in, in tell, as the Charger head coach? The people. Basically said, I didn't really get the support that I needed from ownership. And I think he's with the 49ers now. Yeah. And he was talking about how this is unbelievable. We have everything that we need here to be successful. And this team is committed to winning, taking a shot at the Chargers. Now, here are the Chargers now trying to go with their third offensive yep. coordinator in Justin Herbert's fourth year. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's, they're running a lemonade stand. It just it drives me insane. Um, all right, explain how Staley didn't get fired. You play your starters in a meaningless game. You get Mike Williams killed. Then you go out. Oh, wait, we desperately need Mike Williams for that one first down, for that one 50-50 ball. He's not available because Boy Wonder played him. They blow a 27 nothing lead, and somehow Joe Lombardi's the one who gets blamed? I Help me. All right, I'm going to try to help you, and you may not like what I'm going to say, but here's what I hear on the streets of the NFL and the coaching market and the ownership uh, streets and boulevards is that uh, the Spanos family, and their general manager, Telesco, they actually do really like Brandon Stanley. Oh, that's I'm touching. just telling you, they really like him as a person and as a coach. I'm, that's, I'm just telling you flat out. I'm not mad at you. I'm upset at the situation. It's not me. That's I know. Them. You don't make the news. You report it. I'm just trying to report it, and then you can react to it. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. How the hell is that guy still there? You know, I wish, I wish more teams would be more stable, especially when you have – talent like Justin Herbert has. He's a once-in-a-lifetime prospect. Right, and you're already now going on to his third coach, uh, which is going to be really difficult, unless they get somebody in there that has some sort of ties to him or they run an offense that is similar to what he has just run, just call it differently. But, um, yeah, I, I, I understand where you come from, and I understand your frustration, and if I were a Charger fan, I would feel the same way. Um, but I'm just telling you what the realities are on the ground in L.A. Yeah. between the coach and the ownership. All right, let's just get this one out of the way. So the announcement made this week, five teams are going to play games overseas, Germany, London, no Mexico City this year. Uh, the reason I bring it to you is we've heard, oh, eventually there's going to be a team in Europe, or Goodell himself has said about, a, you know, divisionally it'd be easier. Boomer, in the next decade, say, do you think we see this NFL Europe thing happen? I don't think so. I, I don't think so. Unless they, unless they want to take Saudi money and you have – or, you know, uh, Russian oligarch money and allow them to own the teams. Ah. Which, you know, I wouldn't put past the NFL. But I, I don't think in the next 10 years we'll see a division over there, but we'll continue to see this because those cities over there uh, in Europe are paying for the NFL to bring the games there. Uh, I want to ask you about this one. And there was a long-form piece about Howie Roseman, GM in Philly. Um, he built the Super Bowl team. <laughs> tore it down, built it back up, best roster in the league. And I want I wanted to ask you this. So if is he the single best GM in the league? And if not, who is? Well, John Lynch is right there with him. Okay. I mean, you know, San Francisco, when John and Kyle got there, you know, they were the depths of the NFL and they have rebuilt that franchise. John's into... a better drafter. How he might be better in the acquisition. In the free agents or the trades or things of that nature. Yeah, just non-drafting because Howie's had some real bad picks. Well, they also had the Carson Wentz situation that he had to get that team out from under, which he did. And then he drafted uh, Jalen Hurts, which uh, turned out to be a great draft pick. At a very uh, uh, cheap draft pick when you look at the salary. Second round pick. It's amazing. So I was a second round pick too, so it's not so bad. But I will say that uh, Howie is right there with John Lynch. you know, I do think that there are a lot of good teams around the league that have really good GMs that are not guys that are looking for headlines. Just Would you go vulnerable. Eric DaCosta? He's another good one. Yeah, Baltimore. the Baltimore Ravens. Yeah, Again, what do all these teams now have in common? They all have stability in common. Hey, same thing in New England. Yep. You know, you can say whatever you want about not going back to the Super Bowl or anything else, but since Tom Brady left, I mean, they still are a very competitive team, and they are stable. 
And for the first time in a long time, they're looking for an offense coordinator, which is the right thing to do. All right, final word. Give us a good 30 seconds here. What do you got? You know what? I'm, I'm looking at the San Francisco and Cincinnati teams because I thought and I still believe that they are going to be the Super Bowl representatives. They're going to have their hands full this week. I can't wait for these games. And the other team that I'm really looking at to see how they react to all this pressure is going to be your New York Giants at the Philadelphia Eagles tonight. It is going to be a just wild scene down there in Philly. Well, hopefully. I'm sure it'll be a warm reception. Loving fans. Guys, enjoy the games. We're right down to it now. Divisional weekend will be in the books. We will be back with you next week. It is kickoff with Boomer and Valenti. It's kickoff with Boomer and Valenti.